All right, so welcome to the session, uh, Query Logs as a Graph. Um, I will talk about how we use um, a graph and Neo4j to store query logs um, from Neo4j, and also aggregating, sorting, filtering, and all that good stuff. Um, so uh, I'm Sebastian. I'm in the uh, Ops Manager team at uh, Neo4j, uh, and this is the agenda for this uh, talk. I will first just start by going over what is Neo4j Ops Manager for those of you who are not entirely familiar with it. Um, then I will go into the particular problem that we're trying to solve uh, in query logs. And then I will uh, go over the solution that we arrived at um, using a graph. And I will dive deeper into one of the particular issues that we faced in dealing with longer time spans. And then we will finish up with uh, questions. Um, so let's get started with some uh, background into Ops Manager. So Neo4j Ops Manager is a tool intended mainly for database admins that allows you to visualize and manage your estate of Neo4j DBMSs. Um, so a Neo4j DBMS is basically an installation of Neo4j, um, and a DBMS can then have multiple instances associated with it. Um, so in this screenshot, for example, we see two different DBMSs. It could be a staging and a prod DBMS, for example. Um, we also have some features like uh, metrics, uh, where you can view metrics on the host level, instance level, and the various database levels. Um, you can set thresholds, you can have alerting, and you can do uh, various things with it. And there is also another very interesting feature here um, in that you can actually drill down to a specific time window. And then you can request the query logs for that time window. So let's say you see an anomaly in one of the charts. You can quickly zoom in on that. And then you can uh, get a complete list of what exactly went on um, during that time. And of course, we have the query log feature itself, um, which is divided into two parts, um, summary and the details tab. Um, in the details tab, we show every uh, query that has run in your DBMS. Uh, line by line. And in the summary tab, we show an aggregated view where each row represents one particular query. Then you can see how many times that query has been run, um, what the average execution time was, what the maximum execution time was, um, and so on. And you're able to sort on all of these uh, numerical values as well. Um, so what is the problem exactly? Well, um, turns out that Neo4j is uh, kind of fast. There can be a lot of queries being executed uh, every second, hundreds of queries per second, uh, perhaps even 1,000 queries per second. Um, and also, the queries uh, can be pretty large. Um, so just to, to clarify again, um, we monitor Neo4j DBMSs, but we also use a Neo4j database as the persistence layer of Neo4j Ops Manager. Uh, and this here is uh, an example of a query that we run ourselves. It's not the biggest query. Um, certainly also not the smallest query. It's, it's just a query that I picked to illustrate that the query size text can be uh, pretty significant sometimes. We also want to support um, fine-grained uh, start and end times so that you can really drill down into the uh, temporal area that you're interested in and, and really um, see what you're looking for in the huge pile of query log data. And we also want to have some sophisticated filtering and sorting as well. So you can uh, filter by instance or host uh, or the user executing the query or what application uh, executed the query. And then you can sort on um, how many, like uh, the, the count of execution, the total time spent on that query, and so on. So you can do things like see the most commonly executed query. Um, the slowest query, the fastest query, and, and all of that stuff. Um, and apart from this, um, we don't only have one instance sending data to Ops Manager. Um, we have several DBMSs, all with several instances, and they can all be sending a pretty good amount of, of data to us. Um, so how do we go about solving this problem? Well, it turns out that this is a pretty graphy problem. Um, it, it turns out that for pretty much all deployments, there is a limited set of uh, actual queries being run, and they are being run over and over again with uh, different parameters. Um, so, uh, and even if you don't use parameterized queries, which you really should, because it's a 
good practice allows the Cypher planner to plan it out and then run the query over and over again with different parameters. Um, but even if, if there aren't any parameterized queries, we, we can still do some obfuscation where we do things like remove string literals. Um, and then we can get the query text into a form where we can deduplicate it. Um, so the data becomes the query text and then execution nodes with metadata about that particular execution of that query. Um, so the data, it looks a little bit like this. We have a C of uh, different queries. Um, let me look at one of them in particular. Um, here we see the, the query text for this particular one. And we also have a hash that we calculate. And this allows us to do a lookup uh, insertion and retrieval without having to do any uh, string matching. So that makes it quite a bit faster already. And then if we expand the executed relationship um, of this node, we can see all of the individual executions uh, of that particular query. Um, so here, here we have a bunch of executions all running the same query. And each execution node contains just the metadata about that execution, like when it ran, how long it took, how many cache hits uh, it had, uh, for example. And then we can further expand that node and we get some other attributes. Um, so we store things like what instance it ran on, um, what database it was targeting, uh, and, and things like that. And if we continue expanding uh, the execution nodes, we can see that they actually have a lot of overlap in the uh, attributes, uh, which tends to be the case most of the time. Like maybe there's a handful of instances, but there will be a large overlap. Um, so we've already done quite a bit of data uh, deduplication, and most of the unique data is, is metadata at this point. Um, so we have something like this, um, a big graph, uh, with a lot of execution nodes that are mainly uh, numerical values. And then we have the query text uh, at the center of it. Um, so let's take a look at some numbers and some assumptions um, to get an idea of, of what, what is required and what kind of uh, amount of data we're dealing with here. Um, let's say that we have a query text of one kilobyte, which is a pretty big query. Um, and let's say we're running 1,000 queries per second. Um, this is, if you were running 1,000 queries per second, probably you would have a slightly smaller query, but just for the sake of getting a worst case figure here, um, this would give us a bandwidth per hour of about 3.5 gigabytes of data, just counting the query text. Um, with this deduplicated uh, data model, adding all the attributes and, and uh, adding all the numerical values, um, we get a bandwidth of about one gigabyte uh, per hour. So this is, quite a bit better, but maybe still not good enough, um, especially when dealing with longer uh, retention times. Um, so we went one step further, and we decided that after 24 hours, the individual query executions would no longer be available. Instead, um, we would aggregate it into a pre-aggregated data format. So what we do here is we match uh, all the uh, executions older than 24 hours. And then we go over, uh, hour by hour. Um, and then we uh, take basically the aggregations um, of those nodes, like the uh, starting time, the ending time, uh, the execution time, average, min, max. Um, and then we store the, the aggregated format of that in, in one hour chunks. Um, and this means that it doesn't matter how often a particular query runs, we can always represent it as 24 aggregated nodes, each representing one hour of the day. Uh, um, so based on the previous assumptions, we had about one gigabyte of data for, uh, for an hour, which would mean 700 gigs for 30 days. Uh, but with the aggregated format, we're down to just 320 kilobytes. Um, that is per unique query. So let's say you have a 1,000 different queries running. Um, that would mean 320 uh, megabytes, roughly. So we still have uh, a lot of headroom here. Um, so what about uh, reading back data to the summary tab? Um, well, we basically, now we have to deal with uh, both single execution nodes and pre-aggregated execution nodes. Um, so what we can do here is that we can actually on the fly transform the set of single execution nodes into one aggregated node. And that is the first part uh, of this query. Um, and then the second part, uh, we uh, look for the pre 
uh, aggregated nodes within the same uh, time window. And this query, by the way, is written in Cypher DSL, which is a very nice way of writing basically Cypher in Java without having to deal with uh, text blocks and, and things like that. Um, and then we just take the union of these, and we end up with a bunch of aggregated nodes. It can be any number, depending on how big the time window the user selected. Um, so we need to do one more thing before we present it to the user. Um, and that is we need to take this list of aggregated nodes, and we need to aggregate it once more. And yeah, the some of the aggregation functions, like min and max, are easy. We can just run min again and max again, and we get the correct values. Um, for the averages, we need to uh, calculate as a percentage how much of a contribution each of the aggregated node makes to the total. Um, so we do this calculation here, um, where we calculate the execution count contribution, we call it, which is basically the share of executions that is represented by that particular node. Um, and by multiplying the averages of that, we can actually recalculate the averages, um, and we get a single aggregated node that we can present uh, to the front end. OK, so looking a little bit at the architecture that's uh, powering this, um, to the left here, we have the monitored Neo4j DBMSs. They are fronted by an internal uh, Log4j instance, uh, which we connect to using a socket appender locally on the machine. Um, and immediately, when there is a log event, we read it using the, uh, our ops manager agent, also running on the same system. And we put it in a processing buffer. And if there is an overwhelming amount of data, we can always uh, drop messages already here, but that should be very uncommon. Um, and then we feed it into a processing uh, part where we do some pre-processing. Uh, we actually do a lot of the deduplication here already so that the server doesn't need to do the heavy lifting. Um, and we also do batching. So when we do transmit the data to the server, um, we already sorted it per query, so it's already uh, sort of a pre-digested format. Um, then we send it to the server. There is another buffer there, um, and we write it to our persistence. Um, we also have a concept of a circuit breaker, which is basically if the system gets overwhelmed, we will just stop processing query logs for a short while so that we don't degrade the other functionality of the system. So we have a sort of graceful degradation in case it is a really extreme amount of queries coming in. All right, at this point, I will uh, see if there are any questions. And uh, thank you for uh, attending this session. And I will also like to plug this uh, session by my colleague, uh, Sasha. Um, he's going to show you an example of how you can actually use this uh, feature to find uh, performance issues. So I highly recommend attending that as well. <laughs>